Welcome to the New Day Community Church Sermon Podcast. We hope you are encouraged by this message from the Nichols Road Campus. For more info, look us up at newdaycommunity.org. All right, good morning, everyone. Jesus uh, said that I am the resurrection and the life. They made this amazing proclamation. I am the resurrection and the life. But what does that mean? Okay, and that's what today's message is about. Well, what, what was Jesus meaning when he said he was or he is, I am the resurrection? The common belief in Judaism in that, that period when Jesus ministered, the Jewish religion taught that... Um, uh, the, uh, the resurrection uh, in this period was that the dead would be raised bodily at the end. That's what the resurrection was. Indeed, the Pharisees, which was a major sect of the Jewish religion, <clears throat> considered those who denied this doctrine, specifically the other major sect, which was the Sadducees, it's like a denomination, okay? <laughs> the other denomination didn't believe in a, in a literal resurrection and the Pharisees thought that the Sadducees would go to hell because they didn't believe that. Right? So this is a very important uh, belief that was common in Jesus' day, that the resurrection was an event the, in the future, really the grand finale at the end of time, God would raise everyone from the dead. Uh, but Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Okay, so if you stop and think about it, that doesn't make any sense. All right? You like Tom Brady saying, I am the Super Bowl. Oh, good analogy. Come on. Give me some Tom Brady. It's like, Tom, I know you're a really big deal. Okay, but you're not the Super Bowl, all right? It exists before you. It will exist after you, right? <laughs> Here, the story Jesus said this in, in this story in John 11 it says Martha said to Jesus um, uh, so this is after uh, Martha's brother Lazarus had died um, Martha said to Jesus Lord if only you had been here my brother would not have died but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask and Jesus told her your brother will rise again Yes, Martha said. He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, this is in the context when Jesus said, hey, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she said. I've always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world. I don't think Martha really got what Jesus was saying there, all right? Martha was placing her hope in an, an event. But even that hope didn't offer the comfort she needed in the midst of her pain, all right? So she wanted something more. She said, yeah, I know this is going to happen in the end, but I'm grieving now. She believed in Jesus, but her hope was actually somewhere else. It was in an event. And Jesus confronted that belief by challenging the very definition of what is meant by resurrection. <clears throat> so my question to you is, and to myself, is where are we looking for our hope? All right? When Jesus said, I am the resurrection, he's saying, listen, I am your hope. like the men in black. We are your first, last, and only line of defense. <laughs> Jesus is our first, last, and only hope, but he dresses in white. <laughs> I got a sports analogy and a movie analogy. <laughs> So if we, like Martha, are hoping for some future event or any event, even something God will do, we're missing it. God's promised to do some amazing things. 
in our life and in the future. But we can't put our hope just in the event. Changing the circumstance. Our hope must be in the person. Jesus. God the Son. Fully human. Fully divine. The Lamb that was slain. The risen Savior. The Lord of Lords. The King of Kings. He and He alone. He's our hope. And whatever he does, whenever he does it, however he does it, whether we understand it or not, we can have hope in him. Martha knew about the resurrection, but she didn't understand the resurrection. So she was putting her hope in something that wasn't really anything she understood. But when we put our hope in the person of Jesus Christ, we can have a confidence. Our only hope for a future resurrection is the hope that we have now in Jesus Christ. All right? You're hoping for something in the future? You need to root, have that rooted in the present. And the Bible explains this. Paul expresses this in his writing to the church in Philippi in Philippians chapter 3. He says, whatever gain I had, in other words, Paul's saying, all the stuff I had, I, I kind of is lost. It's, it's worthless for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Everything in Paul's life. And listen, it was substantial. He was a leading religious figure. And and even at this point, it would include all of the things he had done for Christ. It's all that stuff doesn't matter. It's it's junk. It's rubbish in order that I may... Uh, gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness that, of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness or the right relationship with God, being in the right place with God that comes, uh, that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Okay? So Paul is referring to Christ's resurrection that Jesus rose from the dead, but also the power that exists in the present and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection. So now he changes. He's talking about this future resurrection from the dead. So in this verse, we have Paul saying, it's all about being in Christ, knowing Christ in order to access the power of the resurrection now so that when, it, when he returns, I can experience the fullness of the resurrection. Paul's hope for future resurrection was his relationship with Jesus as Lord in the present. Present tense. Being found in him. Our life in Christ, if our life is in Christ, think about this, if our life is in Christ, then death cannot contain us because it couldn't contain him. And if we're in him, death has no power over us. And that's why it's so important to understand what it means to have our life in Christ. The Bible declares that there is now no condemnation for those who are where? In Christ Jesus. So right now we can step into the righteousness that Christ obtained for us and not have any condemnation, all shame and regret washed away and have the confidence of power over death, over sin, over sickness, over Satan, over the world. We stand in Christ. In Corinthians, it says it this way. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is, not will be, is 
a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything's new. Behold, it's all new. I mean, these are amazing promises of Scripture. But we're misunderstanding them if we think, oh, that re- that, that's talking about in the future. I'll get there eventually. May I suggest to you that the measure that you experience in the future is dependent on the measure you accept it, believe it, and step into it in the present. The eternal now. Now is the day of salvation. Now is when it happens. Now everything is new. Jesus has done all that he can do. We just need to step into it. Being in Christ means our identity is found in him. Is it? Is your life, is our life, is my life in Christ right now? You know, how that happens is when you come to the place that you believe Jesus is who he said he was. You believe his claim based on the evidence of Scripture, the evidence of the testimony of the billions of Christians whose lives have been changed and the evidence that you've encountered in your own life that he is God, the Son, the Messiah, and that you put your trust in him and that you yield your life to him and you say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I surrender to you and I ask you to forgive me and I receive you as Lord and Savior and I will follow you all the days of my life. You are Lord. I confess you as Lord. When you do that, you put your life in him. doesn't mean you're perfect automatically, but it means you're in him. And no part of us, this is important, no part of us should exist outside. If we're in Christ, we don't want parts of us dangling outside of being in Christ because it's only in him, in his personhood, that we have life. This is an abstract theory, okay? Not theory. So. A little more than a theory, folks. <laughs> this is Christianity. This is the gospel, that we can live in the person of Christ. All right? Yeah, it's mysterious, but it's true. And it's, it's not that abstract. It's, it, I'll explain it a little more. But we need to understand that every part of us needs to be inside him, because in him is life, and that therefore means outside of him is death, right? He conquered death. If any part of us continues to linger outside of Christ, that part is actually dead and must be cut off. Any aspect of our our life that is existing outside of the influence, the control, the um, grace, the, the life if it's not originating from Jesus, if it's not connected to the vine and filled with the, the, the lifeblood of the truth and the love of God, then it's, then it's, it's a dead. It may connect to us, but it's dead. And it has to be cut off. Uh, least we risk that death pulling more of us out of relationship with Christ. You know, the death grip. And if you don't cut it off, more of you will get pulled out. Being in Christ means that we relate to everything else, everyone and everything, including yourself, in life through our relationship with Jesus. If you want to read about this, you can read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's explanation of what it means uh, when Jesus, when the Bible says that Jesus is the mediator uh, between, uh, there's, there is only one mediator between God and man, the, the, the person Jesus Christ. And he, he elaborates that Jesus must be the mediator between us and every other aspect of life. 
All right. Um, <clears throat> here's an example. Most of us here, there's a few exceptions, are Americans. Hey, praise God, we're Americans. <laughs> Americans. All right, we spent most of our life in the U.S. <clears throat> we look, we think, we act, we talk, we interpret our world like Americans. All right? And when you're in another country, or if you're from another country, guess what? We stick out like the sore thumbs we are. I was uh, early in my years uh, beginning to travel internationally. Um, he's not related. His name is Fred Wright. He's a uh, former head uh, network that we were associated with. And he um, took me along in some of his journeys. And he had traveled. Actually, at that point, he'd already he had gone countless nations, countless travels, but had actually went around the earth one way five times, you know, in mission endeavors and visiting five times. You know, I was like, man, I still have yet to do that. <clears throat> it's on my bucket list. All right. But he was sitting with me on an airplane. He's like, you know what? You can tell every American. And someone walking a plane, that's an American. Actually, no, they're not. They're probably European. You know, he'll pick a country or whatever. Oh, he was like, well, that's obvious. And it's absolutely true. Okay, I remember once, uh, a number of years ago, Kathy and I, <clears throat> we went to a conference in, in uh, London, but we went a few days early. Uh, Kathy had always wanted to go to Paris, so we, we spent two nights in Paris. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a husband tip, man. If you really want to bless your wife. <laughs> Paris was a nice town. <clears throat> but if you're ever in a city that has a, a river, like Chicago or London or Paris, go on a riverboat cruise. Big tip. Um, <clears throat> and so we're on the boat cruise, and there was a group of Americans. And Kathy and I were like, oh, my goodness. Because they were loud. Talking really loud. <laughs> Even though there were a whole bunch of other people on the boat. And just, I mean, we are what we are. <laughs> Lovably so. <laughs> All right. Um, it takes a lot of work, actually, to see the world, to see other people, and to respond outside of our American mindset. Because we're so immersed in it. And it wasn't until I started traveling internationally that I actually started to recognize it in me. You know, and I don't try to pretend not to be an American when I'm in other places, because everybody would know it. But I try to be a little more respectful. <clears throat> Are we that immersed in Jesus? When we walk into the room, do others see that we're walking with Jesus? In the same way that international people see that we're American. Are you hearing me? That's what it means by being in Christ, immersed. That's what the word baptism means. That baptism into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is that we're to be so immersed into the name and, and the character of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that it exudes wherever we are and in whatever we're doing. That we see and respond to every person, every circumstance, every thought through the filter of Jesus. He's mediating our relationship with every other thing in person. But what about this idea of suffering and death? Because that's, like, that's what the resurrection is about. Okay? Christianity is not a fairy tale that enables us to magically escape reality and live happily ever after in some alternate reality. Okay? And if that's what you think... You're watching science fiction or fantasy. You're in a video game. That's not what Christianity is. And I think the story of Lazarus uh, from where we get the entire text is a perfect example of this. Lazarus was sick and Jesus could have healed him, but he didn't. All right? His closest friends, Martha and Mary, Lazarus himself was one of Jesus' close friends. It says that in Scripture. And his disciples couldn't figure it out. Jesus knew Lazarus was sick, 
And he didn't go there. He just thought, yeah, I know, Lazarus is sick. <laughs> Sometimes we get sick. And some, right? Friends and loved ones get sick. And sometimes we see a supernatural instantaneous healing. But sometimes we don't. We're grateful for that. I'm grateful for medical healing. But guess what? Everybody dies. Right? The Bible says this. Just as each person is destined to die once. And after that comes judgment. So also Christ died once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. We can learn about Jesus through this experience of death. And it's part of the experience. It comes with the package of being human. All right? He will come again, not to deal with our sin, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly, eagerly waiting for him. <clears throat> I've had two friends, pastors, both of them pastors, both I respected, Unbelievable. I couldn't believe these men, solid men of God in the last eight months die. One from COVID, one from cancer. Why didn't Jesus heal them? Hundreds, thousands. In one case, probably tens of thousands of people were praying for the man who had cancer for years, myself included. He died, died. I know he'll raise them in the resurrection, but what about now? And Jesus, Jesus in the story of Lazarus, he said, <clears throat> when you heard about Lazarus, he says, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. <clears throat> Excuse me? No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Jesus said that while he was hanging out waiting for Lazarus to die. <laughs> and he did die. But it didn't end in death. And Jesus raised them from the dead to demonstrate that he had the power over death itself. All right? Wow. It's pretty significant that Jesus allowed Lazarus to die and then demonstrated he actually resuscitated Lazarus to life, to live again, so that everyone could see, called him out of the grave, to demonstrate that Jesus had the power over death. And so when we die or someone we know dies, guess what? That's not the end of the story, All right? Just like it wasn't in the story of Lazarus. It's not the end of our story if we're in Christ. There's only one doorway out of this life into the next, and death is that doorway. But you don't have to walk through it alone. Aren't you happy? You, you have the opportunity if you're in Christ, to walk through that door with Christ. If we're in Christ and Christ is in it, us, we'll walk through that path with the person, the one who conquered death. And that leads us to what Carrie read and that song was about, Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely a goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so that's that promise that's on the other side of the doorway of death, that forever we will be in God's presence uh, feasting. Jesus is a resurrection you know, the title of the series is Past, Present, and Future, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> but Jesus is the resurrection in the present perfect tense. And if you're not a word nerd, you can Google that, all right? <clears throat> it means the present perfect tense. It's kind of unique to English. It's in some other languages. It's about a continuing situation or state uh, that started in the past continues in the present, and likely continues in the future. So we, could, we actually in English talk about things that are past, present, and, and future as one is continual. And that's what Jesus is. Last week we talked about that historical resurrection of Jesus Christ when he rose from the dead after suffering and dying on the cross, being buried, and that, that literally happened. Our faith is in that. 
But Jesus is our resurrection today, as well as being our hope for resurrection on the last day. And you know what? This must, the, the effect of this must be seen in the present, in the now, and how we live uh, in, in our day-by-day day lives. Just like Lazarus coming out of the tomb, they had to remove the grave clothes that they had, they had wrapped him with, the, the cloths that they wrapped dead bodies with. And so he comes out of the grave, but he's still entangled with the, with the, 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 the wrappings of death. And they had to unwrap that. And, and likewise, we have to remove the remnants of death after experiencing the resurrection power of faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible, I'm just, I'm not going to explain this uh, because, you know, sometimes the Bible does a good job of explaining it. (laughs) I think most of this is pretty well understandable. It's easy to understand. It's a little harder to put into practice. But this is what it means to live in the power of the resurrection. And this is uh, in uh, the letter to the Colossians. It says, if you were raised with Christ, notice it has a past tense there. These people hadn't died and been resurrected in the future when Christ returns, had they? Right, because we're still waiting for that. But they've experienced being raised to newness of life through faith in Christ, all right? And through the the, uh, baptism, when you come out of the baptismal waters, you're raised to newness of life. It says, if you were raised with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. Think about, concentrate, put your thoughts centered on not earthly things, worldly things, but heavenly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members, those parts of you that are dead, living outside of Christ. And then he lists some things. Fornication. I do have to explain this. Because I just saw uh, a few days ago, uh, someone said, Jesus never mentioned a particular sexual sin. Um, that happens to be popular in our day and age. <clears throat> and I'm like, like every time uh, Jesus in the New Testament, um, every time Jesus used the word fornication or unclean, uncleanness uh, or any variation of that uh, Greek word <clears throat> and throughout the New Testament, it is based on the Old Testament definition that goes into great depth of what is appropriate and what is inappropriate and sinful sexually. And so if Jesus or here the scripture mentions fornication, that is all sexual sins as defined in what was at that time recognized as holy scripture being the Old Testament. He didn't have to list every single type of sexual sin because that would take the rest of the book. Right? And notice it's just wrapped in with all those other sins, but it is fornication, uncleanness, passion that would be un- inappropriate, lust and desire, uh, evil desires, covetousness. Let me see somebody else's big truck. A really cool motorcycle yesterday. I can appreciate it. I'm like, that was that's tricked out, man. But I got my own humble little bike. (laughs) (laughs) Which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Okay? So what the people he was writing to is like, you guys were all actively involved in those uh, lifestyle patterns. But, but you're rescued out of it. Amen. But now you yourselves are to put off all these things. And he lists some other things like anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, 
filthy language coming out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and, put, and have put on the new man who's renewed according to the knowledge, uh, uh, renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. So any, any racism, that's not part of us. Circumcision or uncircumcision, any religion, religious distinctions you know, because of our uh, uh, ethnicity, it's not part of us. Barbarian, <clears throat> again, referring to ethnicity or um, um, uh, uh, citizenship. <clears throat> Scythian, I don't even know how to say that. Slave or free, economic status. But Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. These are the things that are in Christ. Kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Oh, this is a good one. We can all aim in this. If anyone has a complaint against another, that complaint is part of the dead that needs to be cut off. Anybody ever complain? <laughs> Nobody here. <laughs> Even as Christ forgive you, you also must do. Darn. <laughs> That's right. Damn it. Damn the complaint. Can I say that? <laughs> I think this service is going to get me in trouble. Okay, it <laughs> But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body. And be thankful. Are you thankful? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, sing to one another spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You guys save this. 